Thank you. My name is Ron Fiamma. I'm with AIG uh, out of New York City, and uh, together with our partners at Bridgepoint Risk Management, we're the sponsors of this three-day speakers forum. This is our third year doing this. It's a real thrill for us. Uh, my role back home at AIG in New York is uh, overseeing our collector automobile insurance program. Um, we're proud to insure 13 out of 18 of the best in show winners at Pebble Beach. And hopefully after tomorrow, it'll be 14 out of 19. So we'll see what happens. But uh, without uh, further ado, I want to introduce our guest panelists who need no introduction. Um, this is a forum about education, entertainment, and obviously about cars. And I think you'll hear all that today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if we're lucky, we may get... Uh, Donald's tooth to sparkle before the end of the day as he does on the TV, so we'll see. So without that, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Jay and Donald for today's session. Guys, Thank take it away. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Yama. Rarely have I seen a speaker electrify the house the way Ron <laughs> Now, I'm a bit of a loss here. I have no idea what, this is supposed to be a surprise to me. Donald and his attempt to humiliate and degrade me. It's not told me what we're going to be talking about today, so it will be strictly off the cuff. He's got a lot of paperwork here. I have no idea what it's going to be, so let's say uh, we might as well get started. What is this about, anyway? Bug up, folks. It's time to assess and caress with the club. If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. There you go. So, uh, yes, thank you all for coming here today. Um, I have to say, uh, it is always a thrill to be here with Jay and having fun uh, and delivering some entertainment and education, uh, which we love to do. I also need to say that I am absolutely horrified, mortified in fact, about the fact that I looked at a picture of a still from our program last year, and I have about 175 bow ties. I wore the same tie I wore last year. So I just wanted to say that before, before Jay had a chance to say it. <laughs> um, what we're gonna be talking about today uh, is something which I think uh, Jay will find very interesting, and hopefully you all will find as well. Uh, talking about automotive technology, uh, one of the things that, uh, if you were here at the uh, seminar last year, I analyzed Jay as a collector and sort of tried to figure out what, was, what were the things that held his very, very, very varied uh, collection together. And I, uh, I decided that Jay collects with heft. And everything that he has, car, motorcycle, scooter, uh, steam engine, it's about history, uh, emotion, uh, fun, and technology. And because of that emphasis, I thought, you know, it's really funny. I was walking through the garage and I thought, it's really interesting that Jay is as fascinated by technological ideas that were great breakthroughs and, and innovations that worked and changed the motor car or the bike, and as much as those things that didn't work at all and right. just sort of dead ends. And so I had a very, very clear idea about what it is that we might talk about today. And as I worked on the presentation, it changed completely, but we couldn't change the title. So here we are. So, <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. But Thank I'm you. <laughs> so basically, I looked at um, from the Benz Patton Motorwagen in 1886 to the McLaren F1 in 1994. Um, Jay and I have had this conversation a lot about the fact that most of the inventing was done fairly early on in right. the history of the car. And uh, everything that we've seen since has been a, a refinement of that. Right, right. And uh, so I wanted to get. Uh, Jay's idea, look, this is a uh, 1886 Benz Potten Motorwagen. And what did his wife contribute to that? You she know? actually drove the car in its first long distance drive. But she invented something. You might not know this. I might not, oh, actually, I do know this and I've completely forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> that might work on your SATs. But work, yeah. <laughs> Brake pads. She and the, the wife thought, you know, if we put something on here, it stop, might help you to some stop. friction to stop. Yeah, she invented the brake pads. Yeah. It's always a good idea. So the question is, how did we get from the Benz Patton Motorwagen to the McLaren F1? Was it a straight line? And if not, uh, I know that for the early cars, people really experimented a lot with where the engine should be, where the axles should be, how many wheels there should be, and all that. 
And uh, I know that Jay is a big fan of the panard. Right. He's got a number of them, and the system panard basically set up what we know as the modern motor car. Right, the, the idea of the engine in the front, transmission in the middle, uh, drive wheels in the back. It all seems very commonplace now, but at the time, they didn't know that. They experimented with all sorts of crazy things. I mean, the tricycle, which when I ever see those DD on things, they look ridiculous. Because to us, it's a children's toy. Right. But at the time, you'd see these grown men with top of wheels riding a tricycle <laughs> down the street. And it, it looks hilarious to us because what was uh, a mode of transportation was considered pretty advanced. Later, when it became a child's toy, and that's how we relate to it, you know. But it looks sort of funny when you see it. Now. I know one of the things that, that also we've talked about often, and that is something that you also uh, respect very much, is the fact that the engineers at this time, at the birth of, of the car, were presented with problems. You know, how do you make the car run? How do you make it safe? Uh, how do you make it reliable? And nobody had the answer, so you just came up with an idea and you tried it. Right, right. Which is uh, a fascinating thing in and of itself. And the interesting thing is, almost all the technology we have now, we had in the first 20 years. We just didn't have the metallurgy or the lubrication properties or uh, the technology to, to follow it through. I mean, overhead valves are always considered better than flatheads, but in terms of keeping the oil in the car and, and keeping it, the flathead actually won out because it was quiet and reliable and nobody went 70 miles an hour. Speed was just, you wanted reliability, especially in America. 70 miles per hour, you want to fly off the planet? Exactly, exactly. Well, Which people is... used to think you couldn't breathe about 60 miles an hour. I mean, there was talk of that. At 60 miles an hour, with the wind coming, you would not be able to ex exhale fast enough if you didn't have a windshield. I mean, it sounds silly to us now, but if you think about it, it made sense. Because up until 1900, people never went more than 4.8 miles an hour. They didn't. I mean, if you rode a horse, maybe. But for armies, armies can only move across Europe at five miles an hour. That's as fast as you could march. Walk. Yeah, walk or march, yeah. yeah. And then when the vehicle came in, people were going 25, 30 miles an hour. That seemed unbelievable. I mean, 25 miles an hour seems slow to us now. But get in an 1898 car on a dirt road and go 25 miles. Oh, dear God! Oh, I can't stop this thing. You'd be screaming your ass off trying to get out of it. <laughs> There's yeah. a reason why they passed the Flag Act in the yeah, UK, because exactly. it was a really dangerous thing to have this thing hurtling down the road and yeah, unsuspecting yeah. Uh, uh, pedestrians and, and, and horses. I once got stopped on the 405 driving my Stanley Steamer. I was, it was made of wood, it was on fire, and I, and I passed a cop. <laughs> and, oh, uh, and he called the fire department. <laughs> and I'm going along, and, because flame, um, it says on the Stanley, uh, if, if it does catch fire, it, which makes sense, it's a, increase speed until flames blow out. <laughs> that's what it says. So you just, you go faster and, <laughs> oh, oh, but that's what I was doing. I, it front caught fire, so I, let me increase the speed a little bit. I'll turn off, the, and, and then that's, it blew the fire. By the time the fire department came, they came running at me with axes. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's under pressure. Don't, don't hit that with an ax. It's, what, do I, That'd be bad. No, no, yeah, yeah, so we might as well get it. But that's what it said. In case, increase speed to blow out flame, which that makes perfect sense. At the time. Absolutely logic Hilarious. in the development of the motor vehicle, <laughs> which, even though you have no idea, and again, ladies and gentlemen, he has no idea what's in this presentation, he has just given me the perfect uh, lead to our next topic, engines. Okay. Now, um, of course, there was a lot of experimentation about what's best, um, and bigger is better, what layout, uh, heavy, low rev revolutions versus small, light, and high uh, revolutions. As, as the car developed, uh, it went through a lot of different uh, ideas. Here, again, we're back to the Benz Pottenwagen, and uh, it doesn't look much like a uh, car engine. It looks sort of like a sewing machine or something. Well, it does look sort of lawnmower-ish, I mm -hmm. guess you could say, but it's actually pretty sophisticated when you look at it. You start it by spinning that big flywheel. You would spin that, and, the engine, doo, 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 and then it would catch. You'd have a magneto that would catch the spark, and it would run, and it was actually quite reliable. In fact, Benz is why. When he invented that, he went somewhere, and he took the train. And his wife thought, oh, it's a gag. I'll drive the car and go meet him there. He wouldn't even take the car there. <laughs> it's the first time the wife took the car without telling her husband. 
<laughs> and she made and, it. And she made it, and she was there waiting for him when he were in the car. And he was astounded that she was able to do that, but that it had the reliability to make the trip. So, exactly. So and cool. uh, this first engine was uh, 354 cc and made three horsepower. And um, you know, engineers thought, well, if that does that, so we just sort of make it bigger, and that'll make it faster. And so we get to uh, this, which is a six-cylinder, 21.7 liter, 320 horsepower Fiat Aero engine. Yeah, that's in my uh, that's in my car. That's is, is that the same engine in that car? Yes, in the Mephistopheles. Oh, it is the same motor. Okay. Which is a on a 1908 Fiat chassis. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now you are the king of really, really, really big engine cars. I like the big engine cars. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mine is, uh, when you figure, each piston is a 350 Chevy, <laughs> basically. And, but that's, that's, mine is 1915, and you'll notice it has bevel drive to overhead cam and four valves per cylinder. Technology we consider quite modern now. I mean, it's pretty sophisticated. I mean, this here is your, your, the, uh, your bevel drive. There's no chain driving the overhead cam, but it revs out at 1800 RPM. <laughs> But at the time, that was considered pretty revolutionary. It was, it was pretty sophisticated. But even then, they knew four valves were better than two. You know? And it's an interesting thing. Uh, you're going to see this. Uh, come, this is an engine that you're very familiar with. <coughs> um, this is in uh, your 1916 Pierce Arrow. Right, right. And the distinction of this engine for the... Uh, this is still, to this day, the biggest engine ever put in a car. It's 826 cubic inches. <laughs> Uh, it's a six cylinder with three spark plugs per cylinder. There's so much surface area to the piston that you have three plugs just firing, you know, as the flame moves across, you know. Um, it was, it, this was used in fire engines. Uh, this is a car that's never really been apart. Because it's so low revving, it's 70, you're turning 700, 800 RPM. So the engine didn't really wear out and it didn't get hot. I, I still drive it on a hot day. It's the only one that doesn't, because you're not, it doesn't need to rev. It's just, I remember once I was pulling away from a light and I go, what, geez, what's wrong with, oh, I'm in fourth. <laughs> because it had so much, it has so much torque. I mean, it, they're really fascinating to drive. It's, a, it's sort of like the hand of God. It just literally pushes you down, down the road. But uh, the lightweight V8s and the high revving engines came along and this sort of was seen as old fashioned and kind of, not as efficient, so they, they, they didn't last too long. But it, and when, when you think about the, uh, the 320 horsepower put up by that 21 liter Fiat Aero engine to this engine in your McLaren F1. Right, right. 618 horsepower from six liters. Right. <laughs> so it, uh, all of a sudden it's uh, a very, very different animal. But yet today we're back to um, very low revving engines because of the uh, multi-speed automatic transmissions right, that right, we have today, right, right. which is quite interesting. And then uh, we were talking about different power plants. Now, of course, the amazing and interesting thing is the fact that everyone is very uh, excited about the role that the electric car plays, and uh, the electric car was, was one of the big contenders at the dawn of the uh, passenger car. There were three. Uh, electric car had a third of the market, steam had a third of the market, and internal combustion had a third of the market. And uh, electric had the same problem then it had now. It, batteries. Although that goes 80 miles on a charge, which is pretty amazing. I mean, it, and quiet and efficient. The trouble with them were, men bought them for their wives, because most cars you had to hand crank. And this thing, you just get in, you turn the key, and you, and you pull away. So the rich guys bought them as shopping cars for their wives. And it's the same problem that Lee I. Cooker had with the Mustang and, and uh, Mazda had with the Miata. Oh, it was seen as a woman's car or a secretary's car. That's why they developed the Shelby GT350, because the Mustang had the smallest engine. GM had a 327. Everybody else, had, they only had a 289. So that was a small, so that let's make it a racing car so it doesn't get the perception of being what they called a secretary's car, you know. In fact, in Boston, where I grew up, there was an ad for the Mustang called Six and the Single Girl. It showed the single girl <laughs> with a six-cylinder Mustang. And the, engine, and, the, and, the, and the magazine ad was banned in Boston because it, <laughs> it alluded to the, the popular bestseller Sex and the Single Girl. So 
the four dealers were not allowed to run the ad. <laughs> sure, sure you have time, but now you have porn stars selling stuff. It's, 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 but back then, that was true. They couldn't, you know, oh, that, oh, that was a little racy Catholic church. You had, you had to have sex in the thing. A sex seller, that it sounds like sex. Very, very funny. But, but yeah, that was a problem with the electric car back in the day. Even when the Prius came out, the same sort of thing, you know. But now electric cars. I drove the new Tesla Roadster. Mm. Quarter mile in 8.8. And zero to 60 in 1.8, and a top speed of 250 miles an hour, and 620 miles on a charge. You can go to San Francisco and LA up and back on a single charge. So now, it shows you how far we've come. And you mentioned driving on the freeway. Uh, you told me a wonderful story, which I think is absolutely astonishing. Think about how people use uh, electric cars. The fact that you actually have driven quite often, your, your Baker Electric on the freeway during commuting times because it's the perfect commuter car. Well, the nice thing about, the, about living in L.A. is the traffic's so bad, I could get on the 101, free, even though it only has a top speed of 22 miles an hour, I could get on the 101 at freeway, go three exits to NBC and get off because nobody was going faster than 15 or 18 miles an hour. So I would just get into the fast lane and I'd, I'd just sort of move along and people would wave. And, you're being a guy in a, in a Corvette or a Ferrari, and, I just, uh, and you just go, get off the, because I, I prayed for heavy, tra oh, I hope there's heavy traffic today, so I can get on the freeway. So, I, oh, I get on, oh, this is great, and I, I go my three exits and get off. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. The only man in L.A. who, who oh, looked great. at the traffic reports, hoping for heavy traffic so he could drive his You use his it to your advantage. To, uh, you find to, to what's work. out there, and then you turn things to your advantage. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Lemons, lemonade. Yeah. Uh, and we were also just talking about Stanley Steamers. That was the one that caught that fire. Yeah. <laughs> the famous fire wagon. The whole thing, it's all wood except for the top part. The, the chassis is all, all wood. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, I think. It's and the then, oldest car ever stopped for speeding on the LA freeway. It got me at 96. Did they, uh, not did 96, they, 76, sorry. Did they give you a, uh, a citation? No, no, it frame? Didn't, no, no, he didn't give me a citation. He didn't give me, let me go. It's all right. <laughs> Darn, I'm, I'm sure that the, that, the, that the cop was really hoping to give this oh, guy oh, a yeah, ticket. Yeah, it's like, oh, when you pass say a cop, Lano, oh, nothing like passing a cop <laughs> on fire. It's just, a, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just it's, it's, people have no, they have no idea how steam works. You know, I drove my Doble. My Doble is a steam car. There it is, right there. It was produced in. Uh, how, you know, do we work well together or yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and it's the only steam car you st st turn a key and go. And I pulled into a gas station once, and the lady said, hey, you know, it's, it, your car's smoking. And I go, no, it's, that's steam. She said, what do you, is it overheating? I said, no, no, it runs on steam. A steam car is like, a, uh, okay. And she said, well, why are you putting gas in it? I said, well, the gasoline heats the water to make the steam. And then she said, well, why don't you just leave it in the sun? I said, you know, if the sun could boil water, we wouldn't be having this discussion, really. You know, it, 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 so. But you were actually thinking about coming out with a line of sun tea cars. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was a fascinating car in its day. That, that, that one belonged to Howard Hughes. That car went 132.5 miles an hour in 1925. I mean, it's a four-cylinder compound steam engine. It's really quite fast. I mean, if the internal combustion engine hadn't come along, that might have been what we were driving, we, we'd be driving. The trouble is it just needs too many fuels, oil, gasoline, and water. Uh, the advantage of that car is it meets not all current emissions, but pretty close, because it's a closed system. The fire in that, it's not a boiler, it's what they call a steam generator it's about 3,500 degrees. So it burns all the fuel completely. completely. You know, when you start your internal combustion engine, you notice sometimes water dripping out of your tailpipe. That's condensation as the car starts. Gasoline, a gallon of gas displaces what? And start of almost a quart of water, you know? Uh, but you don't have that with that. Everything vaporizes instantly. The trouble is it's really maintenance intensive, yeah, yeah. As, uh, as you're fond of talking about, the maintenance requirements on cars from the time they were invented through the 1930s were fairly yeah. onerous and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. things that we would never put up with today. I have a 1918 Cadillac V8. It's a change your oil every 125 miles. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, it's like every, every other day you're changing your oil. <laughs> 
But you have your man to do that. You have your so man, yeah. Your man what, what, that, what, what the Doble Handbook says, have your man do this. And there's just pages of things to do every day. You've got to clean out the soot trap and all this other stuff. It's hilarious. The motor car is full employment uh, device. Oh, yeah. And, but people didn't give up on the steam engine and, uh, after the 1930s. And this is a very interesting car, which we had on the show, yeah. uh, the Paxton Phoenix. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. That was developed by Lear? Uh, McCullough. Oh, McCullough. McCullough, yeah. that's right. Uh, and he used the Doble steam car principle. This is just a modern Doble engine, but he couldn't get it to work and eventually put a Porsche 356 engine in the back seat, in, 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 the, in the trunk area, and drove it from the back. Um, it's fiberglass, fairly light car. Um, the 50s were an interesting time. They, all kinds of technology was coming out, you know? After the war, which uh, leads us again, this man is so incredibly brilliant, turbine cars. Yeah. Now, this is such a wonderfully typical uh, post-war English picture, the, uh, the Rover, 1950 Rover Jet 1. And you see them out there just getting ready to do a test. Obviously, it's very good weather because they're only one guy's wearing a hat. I just like the picture. It looks like, sorry, chap, only two seats. What? <laughs> exactly. Uh, why uh, why we'll we'll come back guy? with you why in your bag. The guy's, hey, hey, wait, wait. something just drove by. I'm sorry, sorry, can't, sorry, not today. I mean, why is that guy in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're just ignoring him. They can't give him a ride. It's hilarious. Yeah. So this is the first uh, practical uh, turbine car that was built. Uh, as as uh, some of the, the, re the research said on it. After a few exploded prototypes, they got the Jet 1 to actually work. Well, this is what I love about the English. They can build one of anything great. And then you go, I need two more. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They can't, they can't, can't build them. They build one, here you go, it's all done. There you are. <laughs> I don't want to build a hundred of these. Oh, sorry. You know? <laughs> But we've done the one. <laughs> I mean, I've got an Ariel Adam, and I called Simon Saunders, who designed it. Uh, oh, he said, oh, we're in full production. How many are going to build this year? Oh, we'll do 25. 25 this year? Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, the lads need time for tea. We're exhausted. <laughs> but meanwhile, of course, across the pond, uh, General Motors had a different idea about the turbine car, the, uh, the Firebird XP-21, right, right. Like, you know, a, a fighter jet. I mean, it looks like one. Yeah, there's a, we had a wonderful piece of tape from General Motors with this Firebird car. It also was the first car to have autonomous driving. But the way the autonomous driving works, when you see the video, we had it on our show. Dad is driving, and, and Sis and Mom are in the back seat, of course. Uh, Dad and Timmy are in the front, and they're driving <laughs> along. And Dad says, I'm going to get on the autonomous driving, Timmy. And he presses a button, and a guy in a tower this is uh, the license plate number one coming down the freeway, getting on the 405, and he sits back, and meanwhile, like a, like a, like a pilot, <laughs> as if each car would have their own guy driving it. And the car, when you press a button, it dispensed ice cream, orange juice, and cigars. <laughs> which is good. Because the dad's, the dad takes a car. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a bubble. It's a bubble. He's smoking a cigar. Oh, okay. Timmy's eating, uh, eating ice cream. And Mom is having orange back juice. <laughs> but it's a sealed bubble. He's <laughs> it's just hilarious. Which is why it has to be on autopilot oh, because yeah, they've all right. passed out by three hours. <laughs> and they're in suits. And the women have these enormous dresses on that come out to here, you know. And they're just driving along. And the only car in the highway, oh, good job, uh, X19. OK, you know. And, and then they get back off the autonomous You're cleared driving. For, cleared and, for landing at yeah, Pasadena. Yeah, I mean, it just, it just showed you what they thought the future would be. Nobody can predict the future, you know. When I was a kid, we had a guy come from Bell Telephone when I was in the fourth grade. And he said, by the time we were grown-ups, no American would be less than a mile from any phone anywhere. Wow. And that seemed unbelievable. If you were in the desert, there would be a phone within a mile. They would have a phone within a mile of every single, nobody predicted. Are we within the mile you, of this phone? You carry something. <laughs> so, I mean, nobody ever predicted you'd carry something around, you know? I mean, it's just amazing, yeah. And of course, turbine technology, um, as we saw in the UK, uh, was seen in all manufacturers because the Italians also did it, and the Italians did it with great style, because yeah. look at the flair that the Fiat uh, Turbina uh, had. I mean, you know, this would only be the Italian turbine car. But uh, to your point about uh, the pioneers uh, at Rover, 
they thought, you know, we can make this into a really attractive, interesting, sporty car. <laughs> don't, you, don't you want this car? Yeah, it's not... Uh... <laughs> Well, they wanted a car you could wear a hat while you were driving. <laughs> that was the idea behind it, yeah. But it did zero to 60 in 10 seconds. Which was quite fast back yeah, in the absolutely. day. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I have a Chrysler turbine car, and uh, it, not that one, but basically the same engine as that. There it is right there. And it's a fascinating vehicle. I first saw it in 1964. My dad, we went to the World's Fair, and... Uh, I just wanted to see the Chrysler Turbine car. They unveiled the Mustang, too, at that same show. And they had one in a pit going in circles. And, and I, me and my dad went there. And after my dad's, well, how long are we going to look at this goddamn car? For Christ's sake, look at the hell out of here. I just want to go, for Christ's sake, get the hell out of here. For Christ's sake, goddamn it. My dad just bitching and moaning about the whole thing, you know. But it was a fascinating, it was an amazingly practical vehicle. 209 Americans got one uh, you, for three months. What it is, they had a contest. Imagine doing this today. They wanted America to do research and development on the car. So you wrote a letter to Chrysler uh, saying why I want to drive a turbine car. They, heard, they got college students, they got elderly people, they got engineers, they got people who knew nothing about cars. And each one of them got the car for three months and you got a diary where you would put what you had to do with it. By uh, the way, Jay, I grew up in New York City. Yeah. In Manhattan and in Queens, I wrote a letter to Chrysler. Did and you I could write? not believe that they did not give my really? family New York City oh, a turbine yeah, car. Yeah. I, was, I was stunned. But they had them in New York City. Yes, they did. They had them in New York City. The trouble with the car crushed. was it would run on any fuel that burned with oxygen, but it would not run on leaded gas. You could not run gasoline. And all they had in the 60s was leaded gas. Well, they had the Amico stations, a few Amico stations with unleaded gas, which is a really yeah, bizarre but sort of the advantage. Strange. The advantage of this was... It would run on, when they took it to Paris, they, well, who's, who's annoying me? Hang on. It can't be Donald, he's sitting right here. <laughs> hey, Jay is in. Oh, I'll call Hi, you back. Uh, Just I'm shooting, I'll have to call right. you back. Right. You're right, I'm so glad it wasn't me. <laughs> when, they, yeah. when, they, when they brought it to fan, France, they filled the tank with Chanel Number no. 5. And they, in Mexico with tequila. And in Mexico, they filled the tank with tequila. But the idea was gasoline was only 27 cents a gallon, so alternative fuels are 19 or 20. It wasn't like today where you could have this vast. So it didn't do that well. The thing that killed, the, the performance of the car was about the same as any mid-range V8 Chrysler. It wasn't meant to be a fast car or a sporty car. It was meant to be a personal luxury car. It was designed by the same guy who did the Thunderbird. That's why the styling looks somewhat Elwood similar. Engel. Yeah. And, uh, and like I said, it had one spark plug, it had no cooling system, had instant warm up. The engine actually ran cooler than a gasoline engine because at the time there were all these rumors that it would set the grass on fire because it was a jet. Well, what it has is regenerators. So the, the air would come out and regenerate and regenerate. And by the time it went out the tailpipe, about 120 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it was less than an internal combustion engine. Now, the thing they also use um, some exotic materials in the engine, which also made it rather expensive to, to manufacture. For well, the trouble was that there was a, a, a French metallurgist named Dr. Roy. Now, turbine engines are extremely expensive to build because of the alloys involved. Dr. Roy came up with an alloy that was not good enough for aeronautical use, but good enough for ground-based vehicles. Uh, it's, it's sort of a, it looks like a a gray iron kind of, a, I've got a spare motor sitting next to this thing and you can see what it looks like. And it was okay. The trouble was this car would have cost about $8,000 when a Cadillac was about $6,000. That was, that was part of the problem. But the real killer was the fact that um, the emissions, you can't clean up a jet. And this was 63, 64. They knew by 68, emission laws were coming. But th this thing, if you've ever been in an airport and you smell what a plane looks like when it goes by, that's basically what this was, because they're, they're pretty dirty motors. It, it things <laughs> just goes out the back, you know? And consequently, they didn't think they'd be able to clean it up. Uh, but other than that, it's smooth, it's quiet, it doesn't overheat. You've only got a couple of dozen moving parts. You have one spark plug, 
And mine's bullet. I've never done anything other than just drive it. And it runs fine. I mean, when it breaks, it'll probably be catastrophic, but nothing breaks on it. It, it works fine. And it was just a fascinating page of history, the idea that the Americans would drive this car of, oh, it blew up. Okay, well, thank you, Mrs. Johnson. You know, I mean, there was nobody sued because something right. happened. Exactly. <laughs> People were so excited to have this car. And, and to this day, I hear from guys my age who were kids when their dad or their teacher or a friend had one and they wanted to come back and see it again, you know, and, and go for a ride. I mean, it, it left such an impression on all the kids my age at this time because, well, the rest of the world was, China didn't even have piston-powered cars. People were still on bicycles. Americans are driving around in jet, jet cars. cars. I and mean, you still believe in the crazy. technology because yeah, that's got a this. car we built for. Uh, it's a car we built for SEMA. I used a Honeywell LT101 uh, jet engine out of one of the big attack helicopters. And I was going down the freeway one day, and the cop stopped me. Hello, uh, what is this? Uh, license registration. And he goes, uh, "This is 64 Chevy." <laughs> he said, uh, I don't know they built something like this in 64. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a, you know, oh, okay. All right, well, it'd be kind of, like, yeah, sure. <laughs> but it was okay. <laughs> but he was like 26. He didn't know. <laughs> Oh, it's one of those old cars. Yeah, I've heard about those. Yeah, it's but got you know, the fins, so it must be an old car. Alcoa gave us, gave us, four blocks of that aluminum. And we made those wheels. And it's, it's some kind of alloy. It doesn't dull and it doesn't polish. And it doesn't get dirty. Brake dust doesn't <laughs> stick to it. It just, you know, and it's pretty cool. I think it's- It's like the fish carburetor. Why have you been keeping yeah, this from the yeah, world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's actually out now. They use it on a lot of wheels, but it's pretty amazing. You can polish them all day. They won't look any different. Or you can ignore them and they don't look any different. They don't dull. It, it's, it's really pretty cool. Well, I took a Neil deGrasse Tyson out in that, and, and, and the window blew out at 165. We were gonna go, for, we were gonna hit 200 in it. When the window blew out, I said, well, you know, that's all I need to do is kill Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> and there'll be a lot of this. Jay killed, Jay killed Neil deGrasse Tyson. Dude. Exactly. So we, uh, we, went, we went 170, and then we came back. <laughs> Another interesting uh, avenue in technology for engines that I know fascinates you is the Wankel. The Wankel. I love the Wankel engine. Um, I hate Dr. Wankel. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was an uber Nazi. <laughs> you know, he couldn't even pretend that I was just following others. I did not know. No, he was Mr. Uh, this guy was the most evil Nazi prick in the world, this guy. <laughs> Oh, and after I got the engine, I'm oh, now I hate the guy. I wish I hadn't researched this. He's just a horrible person. But it was an interesting idea, and of course, it took Mazda. Uh, well, first NSU. Well, we NSU Wankel, yeah, that was the first rotary left, engine yeah. car. That thing was 3600 bucks in 1966. You could get a Corvette, or you could get a Jaguar, or that stupid thing, you know? I mean... It's fascinating because it's incredibly smooth. It just, it just, you know, the nice, you know, a piston engine goes up and down. So those, even not a perfectly balanced one, there's still a certain amount of. Whereas the Wankel, just, it just everything spins in the same direction. You remember they used to have those commercials. Normal engine go chugga chugga. Mazda goes. Hmm. Mm. Remember those commercials? Exactly. Yeah. And that's the the one that that was the really first practical dual rotor. It means you had essentially. Uh, well, they're not pistons, but two of the, uh, what do you call it, Chop what was that shape? The rotors, yeah. The rotors, yeah. two of the rotors going around in the same direction. And that was a wonderful car, but it was, again, it was Japanese. The war had only been over a short time, well, 15, 20 years. Um, and it cost as much as a Jaguar with an engine nobody would ever heard of, you know. I mean, so it, it, interesting styling on this. They had no idea how to sell these in America. And they would have Japanese kids with beetle haircuts that playing guitar. I mean, it just kind of all kinds of weird things, you know? But it's like, it's a little bit of Thunderbird, a little bit of Alpha. A little bit of Jaguar. A little yeah, a little bit, bit of, of Jaguar, but it's a Ferrari. wonderful car to drive. It's amazingly quick and fast. Uh, it's hard to find unique driving experiences. All cars now sort of have the same thing. The fun thing about old cars is 
Who is the transmission? Oh, it's over there. What? You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, just all the different things in different cars. Whereas this just look, people drive this and they can't believe how quick it is and how just how smooth it is. It just revs forever. I mean, you, you really need the tack. Oh my geez, I'm doing 12 grand here. Hang on, you know, because it, 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 it's so linear. It's a wonderful, wonderful car to drive. Yeah. And uh, Mazda did uh, develop the, uh, the rotor technology. This is the four rotor uh, engine that they used in the uh, car that they, the Le Mans winner in 1991. Right, right. Um, the first Japanese uh, victory and the only non-reciprocating engine ever to win at Le Mans. The trouble with new technology is it can't just be good, it can't be equal, it's gotta be better. And that was the trouble with, with the Wankel. They're, they're good, but they do use oil, and gas mileage is probably two to five miles per gallon less than an internal Comparable, combustion yeah. engine. Uh, so consequently, people, like they would tell you, just check your oil every second oil change. Uh, every every second fill up, just check the oil. You have to reply, I oh, I am not going to do that. That's ridiculous, and that's why it was a hard sell. And we've gone from have your man every hundred fifty miles rebuild this to I'm not going to check my oil every other fill up. What are you? Yeah, nuts? exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, people don't want to do that. And then of course, if the I not you mention that, yeah. the biggest problem with electric cars, people go. Oh, I'm, you gotta plug it in every day. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's 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 the biggest problem. When they come out with a uh, what do you call a it? A drive-in charger. Where you just pull up over the car and it and it does it through. A, well, that wouldn't be osmosis. No, what do you no. call it? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like like those little charging pads they have yeah, in yeah, Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. What do they call that? Yeah, yeah. Induction. In, thank in, you. Induction thank charge. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. See, it's the women answering these questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so of course, you know. Hybrid drive is brand new and, and leading, latest cutting edge technology, isn't it? No, that's my, I have a 1916 Owens Magnetic. That is an electric car. And at the time, they had the same problem we had with electric cars up until fairly recently. Battery, you couldn't go that far. So this is a gas engine which powers a Westinghouse electric transmission, basically. And it's called a magnetic because there's no mechanical connection between the engine and the drivetrain. You have your engine here and the flywheel spinning this way, and then you have your uh, Westinghouse generator here. And it's, it's, it creates a magnetic field, okay, which spins the engine, okay? When you go down the road, you know when you put two magnets together, it does that kind of weird thing? That's what this thing does. The advantage of it is um, there's no transmission. You just move the lever from one quadrant like a transformer on an old Lionel train to increase your speed. It's an electric car, but it uses gas. The idea is you didn't have to shift. You know, a lot of people could not shift gears because the transmission is not synchromatic. <laughs> you do that and all the, whereas this was the idea, you just get in, you turn the key and you go, and they called it the car of a thousand speeds because you could be at any, any place in the quadrant but it cost $9,000 in 1916. That was the trouble with it. It's a brilliant piece of Edwardian engineering. The transmission was developed in the late 1800s with West, <laughs> George West. Now, you look underneath this thing and it's, I mean, it's all copper, you know, all copper winding. It's beautifully built. I have not done a single thing to the transmission. It is bulletproof. It is over 116 years old. That, the electrical part of it, but because it was so well made and using such heavy gauge copper, and copper doesn't doesn't rust doesn't out rust. or but you know so it's so it, it's interesting. It's an interesting hybrid car. And you mentioned gear changing, which is our next topic. This guy's good. So um, obviously, in inventing the motor vehicle and figuring out what engine it's going to have, the layout, etc., you have to figure out how to somehow vary the speeds. And uh, so I said, uh, here we start with the planets. The Ford Model T. Now that was developed by a guy named Child Harold Wills, or C. Harold Wills. He was Henry Ford's metallurgist. You know, Henry Ford liked to say that he found this Vladium steel in France and used it in his car. Big lie. Wills invented the Vladium steel. He developed it. Ford didn't like to give too much credit. It gave the guys a big head. Uh, <laughs> but Wills also developed the Ford logo with the, 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 the oval. The in oval, one. oval. Yeah. yeah, but he developed the planetary transmission and the vanadium steel for this car. And you know, many people talk today about how different it is, I won't say difficult, different it is to drive a Model T 
But remembering when most people were coming from horses, they had no idea about how to drive a car anyway, so they simply learned to operate this vehicle. It's probably the most brilliant thing since the invention of the iPhone and the fact that it really put America on wheels. It was made of extremely high quality steel. They used to call it a tin lizzie and all that kind of stuff. But you know something, when I would, uh, when I would need parts on a Model T, I would call this guy in Boston, in Massachusetts. He had all these parts, and I figured, next time I go home to Boston, I'm gonna go visit this guy. So I go out to his place, he just got a little house, and I go, where's all your stuff? He goes, it's out back. And all his stuff was outside in a pile, and he would just take whatever piece it was, sandblast it and send it to you. Because with the palladium steel, it was extremely strong. It wasn't as subject to rust as the others, you know? And it was, it, it was, it, it was fascinating to me. What a well, this is the only car that starts on the button every single time. A Model T doesn't need a battery. You spin it, it's got a magneto. It creates its own spark. A guy gave me one. Uh, a guy had one, a, a lean-to under his house for 45 years. A 1922 Model T, you saw that one. Yes. And we dragged it back to my shop. We held the gas can with a fuel line to the carburetor because the thing was all rusty. I pulled it twice and it fired and it ran because it just sits there waiting for you. You've got on the flywheel there are magnets and those magnets spin, they create the spark. So it makes its own electricity. I mean, it's, this is the only car, you know, there's a, there's a terrible movie Travolta did called Battlefield Earth <laughs> where he's, it's like in the year 3000, they find a jet plane from the 20s and they get in, they turn the key, and they go, and you go, that would never happen. <laughs> but with a Model T, it would, because it just sits there, it's just, it's just waiting for you. It doesn't need a battery, it doesn't need anything to run, and that's why it literally changed America. I mean, it really was the greatest invention of the 20th century, I think. And uh, you talked about before how difficult it could be for people to change gears, especially before the invention of, of synchromesh gears, and uh, so, uh, Mr. Wilson, Major Walker, Walter Gordon Wilson invented and patented the pre-selector gearbox to make gear changing easy and also there's another thing that was also advertised to help the woman driver as well. Right, right. Um, but it was invented for a tank right. in World War I. Yeah. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, advertisement for the Armstrong Sidley which featured a pre-selector gearbox. Eyes on the road, hands on the steering. The lever pre-selects and the pedal engages like magic. Well, we should explain what that means. What the pre-selector does was you, you, use a, you put it in first gear like a normal in a clutch, then you drive along, you move the lever to second, nothing happens. As soon as you press the clutch, it shifts. So you could have both hands on the wheel and shift. Uh, the disadvantage was they were extremely heavy, so they weren't very effective in racing. You know, if you want to see something funny, my friend Jerry Seinfeld, you all watch comedians in cars getting coffee, it's really funny. He had a, uh, an Indian comedian, I can't remember his name, Hassan Majadi, something like this. And Jerry called me, oh, I love cars, this guy says, I love cars. Yeah, I'll do you, I'll go. So Jerry asked him to come on. You. And Jerry's got, I think, a box of Ferrari. And they're going along, and Jerry's shifting, and, they, and the kid goes, no, what was that you just did there? What was that? <laughs> and Jerry's face. <laughs> You know, he, he said, what was that he just did? He said, I changed gears. Now, what, is, what does that do? And then Jerry realized this guy knows not. I mean, he's a very funny comedian. He's a nice guy, but he's like 26. And he's not a car guy. It just really made me laugh. Now, what's that? What's that? You, you just did there. What was that? <laughs> he had never been in a manual shift car. Watch it. It's really funny. It just made me laugh. But and the ahead. next development of this is the uh, Kotel uh, electrically activated gear change and uh, which also led to the Cord Bendix electric hand shifting system. Yeah, that's what I have that on my car. It really works well. You know, something, those of you that have older cars that have six volt systems, um, the reason these weren't, were, were sort of dodgy at best when they came out was the, the, alt, the generator couldn't produce enough electricity to run the lights and the radio and all the other things. Wipers. There's a guy named Don Allen who makes a thing called a generator. If you have an old six volt or 12 volt car with a generator, he'll take your generator, take out the inside, and turn it into an alternator. So when you put it back on your car, it looks totally stock. Nothing changes. It's all internal, but he turns the generator 
into an alternator so you make full power. And now mine shifts and the lights stay bright. Because with this car, you come to a light, you take your foot off the gas, and the headlights go dim. And you know, you, you couldn't get it to shift. So it's all really just a matter of electricity. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that these uh, pre-selected gearboxes, especially the Kotal, um, I think, in my opinion, they should have t taken over the world um, because they are so easy to use and, right. uh, and, and really smooth and reliable and, and comparing to a lot of the uh, straight cut gear shifting and all that stuff. It, it must have been like something, like an iPhone. But it looked wimpy. <laughs> Didn't have you know, I mean, there was that certain macho element that, that, that sold the automobile, you know? I mean, men liked it because it rolled, exploded, and made noise, and <laughs> it frightened children and scared housewives, and it, you know, all that kind of thing. So you wanted something that someone else couldn't do, you know? Oh, he can really drive a car, you know? Nobody says that anymore. Nobody says you're a good driver. Nobody goes, hey, stop texting. That's all he's saying. <laughs> nobody, nobody says, oh, oh, you know, my husband is a great driver, my wife's a good driver. Nobody uses that phrase anymore, because it's not even taken as, is a skill anymore. It's just you know. well, again, you know, and and everything old being new again, which actually giving away my last slide uh, today. Uh, Donald, if you could shut off the damn phone. <laughs> it was a timer to make sure that I don't go too far. Oh. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, everything is brand new today. So right. of course, we have the Doppelkupplungsgetriebe. The it PDK rolls off the transmission. Yeah, yeah. It does, absolutely. It, it, it's like uh, ESP and, and, and all those other wonderful things. So, of course, after traveling for, for decades, we're back to hands on the wheel with paddles. Right. Oh, I guess you're right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, that's a long way to go, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of. But, but you uh, know, even Porsche is forced to admit they come back with the manual gearbox because it's not necessarily. I guess if you're racing, obviously, it's how fast you can go. But there's a certain skill that people enjoy. It's why people bond to a vehicle, because you, like I've got an old Bentley, which has the most cantankerous gearbox, and when you perform a perfect shift, uh oh. <laughs> I mean, you feel like you've done something. I mean, there's a, there's a sense of accomplishment to it, but it's true. I mean, if you can, you know, to me, a guy who can drive a 911 manual shift car is, is properly is better than a guy that just beats paddles, you know. And I know exactly what you mean about that uh, sense of satisfaction. I remember the very first time I drove a vintage Bentley and uh, I was so good at the upshifts, I thought, oh, I'm brave, I'm going to try a, a third to second downshift. Yeah, no, yeah. And uh, it was pretty much of a disaster. But I asked the owner of the car, I said, you know, how often do you do that? He said, silently. He said, I do it silently every time when I'm alone in the car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, our, our final uh, segment is on aerodynamics. Now, of course, uh, everybody knows that aerodynamics are a brand new science. It's in 1914, Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, an absolutely beautiful and very capable uh, car, and a 1914 Castagna-bodied Alfa Romeo. Yeah. Now, of course, um, this car wasn't a great success because, unfortunately, the radiator was sort of buried at the level of the front wheel and they had this little air intake, so every time they attempted to drive it, it overheated immediately. But you know, you can't sell something ahead of its time. Progress has to be gradual. When the shock of the new, as they call it, it it's just too much. When the Chrysler Airflow came out in 1934, it was the most advanced car. Uh, that, that, that's mine there, but see that grill in the front? People hated that. And the Packard salesman. That's a 33 Buick. Yeah. The Buick salesman, the Cadillac people, <laughs> they say, well, our car pushes its way through the wind. We, uh, we've got enough power to just power through the wind. We don't care. So it looked, you know, you're sort of like this, standing with the air coming at you. You know, that's really what it was. They only had that grill. That's why I bought this one. It's the only year they did the full uh, aerodynamic front end on it because people just thought it was, it was, just, it was just too much. It was just too much ahead of its time. It looked like a train. It didn't look like a car, motor cars. Franklin had the same problem when Franklin was an air-cooled car and they had a very smooth front end. But as they went up in price, they realized they competed against Cadillac and Packard, which had, you know, this and the, and the big hood Cold ornament faces. and yeah, all that kind of stuff. So they, they, they were forced to put a fake radiator on the front of it to give it the look of a prestige car, you know, there's, there's no reason Rolls-Royce needs that grill in the front other than to make people go, oh, that's a Rolls-Royce, you know. But in a more accepting environment, 
the Tatra was much This is the most underrated car to me. To me, this was a Tucker before Tucker. This is 1938, magnesium block V8, overhead cam, air-cooled, guaranteed to go uh, 20 miles a, on a gallon at 60 miles an hour, which today is not that much, but a car that holds six people and has a V8 getting 20 miles per gallon, that was unheard of. It was more like eight to 12 miles per gallon back in the day. And it is pure error. This is one of the most aerodynamic cars even today because it didn't go fast enough to generate downforce. You know, now you have the wing in the back to hold the front end down, which is really works against the aerodynamics. And drag, yes. Whereas this, this thing just, you know, when you take your foot off the gas, you literally just, you, you feel it, it doesn't slow down. You, when I drive my 32 Packer, you take your foot off the gas, you feel the wind hitting that flat windscreen, it just slows you right down. Whereas this thing just cruises right through. And it has its rear engine, and uh, it hangs over the tail. I mean, I think we've mentioned this before. The funny thing about this was, these, uh, the handling was very much like Corvair or Volkswagen. If you lifted in a corner, you could roll it. And when the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia, these are prestige cars, so all of the upper echelon Nazis commandeered these to use as their staff cars. And in the first week, seven Nazi officers rolled over coming off turns and got killed. And Hitler said, no, because this actually killed more Nazis than the Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> and Hitler, Hitler decreed no more Tatras for the upper Just leave them by the side of the road, walk away, don't drive them. That's probably what saved them. They didn't get taken back to Germany. They, didn't get, they, just, they just left them there because he left, who's killing all my Nazis? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's just a Tatra killing the Nazis. Those damn cars. Yeah. And now, obviously, you said that the, uh, we all agreed the Chrysler Airflow in its initial uh, form was not a commercial success because it was not meant to appeal to the masses. But again, if you have a special audience, this is one of your cars, which is aerodynamically designed, that, probably the only aerodynamic uh, That was Duesenberg. the first Duesenberg ever designed in a studio, in a, in a, in a wind tunnel, I'm sorry. Uh, like, you look at those headlights, they look like implants on a bad stripper, but they're not. <laughs> they're, they're actually more aerodynamic than being in the fender, because it cuts this way. When you look at the rear, the taillights are knife-edged, so the air would come down through the tail light and kind of, so it, and it, it does work. At 60 miles an hour, this turns, with the same rear end ratio, turns less RPM than, uh, than the others because you, you can just go a little bit faster with it. You can feel the difference. Uh, when you realize, when you compare that to any other car designed in 1933, I mean, it just looked like it was built to run over poor people. That was the idea. <laughs> the Very quickly, come thanks. I, to come the on, give me the rent, you old lady. Give me the rent. <laughs> you grab the rent from the old lady and you throw your scar. <laughs> drive away. Twirling right? your mustache. Oh yeah, that looks like you're just there to collect the rent and then then drive off. <laughs> and it has a leather top, so every time it rained, you go back to the dealer and they would put a new leather top on for you. <laughs> Oh, or you'd yeah. have your man to take care you're of You're just that. throwing silver dollars in the ocean driving this thing. Just, just throw money out the window. Hilarious. Those hubcaps weigh 20 pounds a piece. I mean, unsprung weight was not an issue with this thing. No. Well, and it only holds two people. It only holds two people. In fact, Lily, Josiah Lily, he was uh, Lily's son. son. Eli Lily's son. E Eli Lily's son. He didn't drive. He had this car commissioned. So he and the chauffeur is like sitting next to each other. <laughs> they drive around this thing, and it was a depression, and people throw rocks at it. You know, yeah, son of a bitch. And, you know, just, you know, they just throw it. So he got rid of the thing real quick, and it went to England, and then it came back here, and then it became a, uh, when I got it, it was a tow truck. It had a rig in the back. And the guy I got it from, well, there's a funny, I don't know if we told the story about this guy. When I found oh, this yes, car. Oh, yes, 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 we did. We did tell it? Yes. The guy wanted $500,000 for the car. Just a, a, an old guy, very wealthy guy, but still carried his lunch in a bag every day. You know, one of those kind of guys, <laughs> you know. So he said, I'll sell you the car. I want half a million dollars. I said, all right. I don't want the money. I'm not going to pay the capital gain. That son of a bitch in Washington, blah, blah, 28%. I'm not paying. He said, just take the car and pay me later. Said, well, all right. He's like 86 or something, you know, all right, we're fine. So I get the car, and, and every couple of weeks, can I say, oh, don't send me the money, those God, not, not until the capital gains goes down, those son of a bitches, all right, fine, 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 you know. So, so now uh, the car's finished, I take it to Pebble, I take it here. Yeah. I come in second, 
And I still don't own the car. <laughs> so I call the wife and I go, can, can you persuade him? She goes, I, you know, if I bring it up, he'll, he'll hit the roof. Guys, I just, I just want to give him, I'm trying to give him half a million dollars. No, no, he won't take it because it's not, it's not okay. So then I'm, when I'm, then I'm watching the news and then, oh, capital gains, I, I don't know whether it's Bush or somebody, uh, capital gains, 15%. I call him, at okay, give me my money. I, I send him the money. Boom, died two weeks later. Oh. Yeah. He was just living just to get oh, your money. But if he they died, then it would have gone to the family, and I, I should have known it. But yeah, it took three years to give him the money. I, I never had that. I'm trying to pay you. I don't want the money. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. So uh, to, to finish up uh, as quickly as we can, um, the uh, aerodynamics also worked on small cars as well, as your Topolino. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then one of the successes of, of this car is the fact that with a very small engine, you were still able to carry passengers uh, well and at a certain amount of speed because the of most the brilliantly packaged car I've ever seen. I mean, I've had basketball players they sit and they go, I'm not going to fit in that. But your feet come all the way to that front wheel because the engine is mounted, the engine's only this big. And the radiator is behind the engine. Behind the engine. So you've got all kinds of room in this car. It's fascinating what a, this is the first people's car. They all say Volkswagen was the first people's car, but that didn't come out till after the Absolutely. war. This came out in 1936, and they sold half a million of these things, uh, you know, over the life of the car. So this was really the first people's car. And so much more better looking than a Volkswagen. It just has an Italian flair to it. There's really, no chrome or anything on the car so much, really. Everything just sort of polished aluminum. But it looks like a more expensive car than it is. It's 13 and a half horsepower, and it'll go 55. And it's, you know something? I always tell guys, if you want to meet women, you drive around in this car with a cat, okay? <laughs> so just have a cat sit next to you, you drive down, you go through Rodeo Drive, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the most unthreatening looking guy, and, and you have a cat, and there's, there'll be some idiot in a Lamborghini or Ferrari next to you revving the engine, and oh, oh can, I, can I look in that goal? Can I pet the kitty? Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, no, it's, it's, the, oh, it's, it's the greatest car. It's the greatest car. You know, to me, the sexiest cars have both a feminine and a masculine appeal, like the Jaguar XK. I've never met a woman that didn't think a Jaguar was an attractive car. I never a man who didn't think of Jaguar was a tattoo car. You know, the Countach, that's a guy car, you know. I always, tell, I always tell people, if you're trying to pick up girls, you take the mirror. Try to pick up 12-year-old boys, take the Countach. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, really, that's really what it's, <laughs> I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. I'm not really <laughs> Uh, so we, 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 are, we are past out of time. But the point that, uh, that aerodynamics, this is sort of considered oh. the, the NSU uh, RO80. Again, Great the rotary car. engine and uh, one of the first sort of modern aerodynamic sedans uh, with a coefficient of drag of, of three, uh, 0.355. Yeah. Um, the Audi 5000, 0.30, the famous Jelly Bean Taurus at 0.32. In 1955, <coughs> this Alfa Romeo had a uh, coefficient of drag of 0.23. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Which is absolutely astonishing, and which in the production car is not going to be better until next year. The new uh, Mercedes A-Class has a uh, coefficient of drag of 0.22. So it's uh, an absolutely astonishing thing. But that is it that attractive? I think that the 1914 Castagna Alfa Romeo yeah, yeah. Zeppelin is actually. But it's interesting, but you know, all cars have this sort of jelly bean shape now. That that's what you have to have for aerodynamics. You know, I, I mean, the idea of what you think looks aerodynamic is actually much sexier than what is aerodynamic. Like people think a Countach is aerodynamic. Whoa, a Volkswagen a Beetle is more aerodynamic than a Countach. Countach is 0.47 or exactly. something, something like that, because it looks, oh, like a wedge, it must cut through. No, well, that wedge turns into a wall at, at high speed. Well, to your point about uh, drag, a Formula One car is like 0.7, yeah, because yeah. it's just designed to stick. Right, exactly, exactly. But, yeah. uh, so, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, you want to take questions? a few moments for questions? Questions? Any 
full autonomous everything. Everything. Oh. Everything. So you don't even need an audience. Cars, just, TV shows, <laughs> audiences. Well, I think it'll happen fairly soon. I mean, I, I, I have nothing against it. I think it's quite, most cars I see are autonomous now. People are eating or they're texting. Or they're, <laughs> I mean, they're just not, at least, the, at least the computer is paying attention, you know? And, and you know, it's one of those things, again, it's the shock of the new. It's, it's all that I, when anti-lock brakes came out, people, I'm not letting this thing do my thinking for me. I know when I can feel through the pedal. You know, I mean, uh, I remember, remember Barney Clark? He was the world's first and longest living heart transplant. And Bill, it's the devil himself. They're taking a heart from one man, put it in another. It's a horrible thing. You're going to burn in hell. And now it's, 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 it's common. So, I mean, I think it'll happen. I, 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 and you'll always be able to drive if you choose to drive. But, uh, you know, Fully a time, I think you'll always have to have somebody behind the wheel. I mean, you won't be able to sit in the back seat with a bottle of scotch and the car will take you somewhere. <laughs> you, you know, While smoking I mean, a cigar and eating ice cream and, and drinking ice cream, orange yeah. juice. <laughs> I like smoking a cigar in a bubble. In a bubble, and exactly. Eating, and eating ice cream. Another question? Uh, for, the, for the introduction of the folk tale, so we did a month ago, for the uh, folk tale speedsters that came into the meeting for aerodynamics, where did that come from? What inspired that? The Botel speedsters? Yeah. Um, that was inspired by... By both. both. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, it sounds obvious, but I have a car called a, uh, a Crane Simplex, or Simplex mm. Crane, and it was built by Holbrook to mimic the cigarette boats that were popular during 1916, 1918. That was, you know, power racing was coming. And it has all the, it, you, you enter it from the side as you would a boat, and it's all mahogany, and it's, so it, it usually comes from that. I mean, the Duesenberg dashboard when Lindbergh flew the ocean, there's a great uh, Humphrey Bogart movie, I can't remember the name of it, but it's one where uh, he loses his job to an immigrant and he has the guy fired. He, you know, it's, it was a pretty important film back in the day. And he, he, with the money he gets from getting the guy fired and getting the upgrade, he buys a Ford. It's got airplane dashboard, strictly airplane style. Everybody goes, ooh, wow, is it like Lindbergh? And, and that's what they're talking about. So, Whatever is out there, car companies will obviously try to copy. It was boats first, and then airplanes came along. When you look at the Bugatti uh, Atlantique with that spine, that was aircraft fuselage because, oh, it look, looks like a plane on the ground just taxiing all the time, you know? Exactly. So, so that's where the boat tail thing comes. Question back here. So I'm an uh, automotive YouTuber who does modern stuff, but how do we convince people of my age and a little older and much younger that cars like the Type 57 or a Duesenberg or an F1 is cool so that 100 years from now, those cars aren't all in... Uh... Well, you really can't because it's what you grew up with. I mean, when I was a kid, cars like cars from the 50s were just junk. I mean, there was stuff you drove at demolition derbies and in the 60s you crashed them and because it was... You know, it takes a while. I mean, you see it already. I mean, now at Pebble Beach, for the first time, post-war cars a winning best of, show. best of show, which never would have happened 30 years ago because as the old group dies out, the new group comes along. I don't know how you convince them other than, the nice thing is cars are being seen as art now for the first time and they're worth preserving. Even back in the 50s and 60s, nobody thought of a Bugatti as a piece of artwork, you know what I mean? It was just an old car. I remember my dad always saying, why would you pay more for an old car and a new car? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> because the new was always the way to go. Absolutely. You know, so now we're at the point where we look back at our history and you keep, that's how I got, I mean, when I got into cars, I liked the muscle car. What came before that? Oh, the Chrysler 300. What came before that? Oh, that takes you all the way back to the Stanley Steamer, you know? Well, I'd like to address the gentleman's question as well, because uh, Demetrios, would you stand up, please? Uh, this young man is uh, 11 years old. He was here last year at our, at our forum. Oh, yeah. Seminar. Hi, Demetri. How are you doing? Uh, hi. And uh, so there are young people interested in cars. I go around to a lot of places, and people from uh, young boys and girls from 8 to 12 always come up to me and say how much they enjoy the show and enjoy learning about these cars that they've never seen before. Um, and car collecting is new. People started collecting cars after World War II. So the, collectibil the, the collectible field of cars is simply growing. The Romans collected Greek art, so we've just started. Demetrios. Yes? Oh, um, I was wondering, what do you think are the cars, the uh, classical cars of the now? What do you think will be the next 
classical uh, cars because now it's the post-war. What do you think will be next? What do you mean from now? You mean when you're our age, what will be collectible? What? <laughs> what will be? We'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter. <laughs> well, I've always said this. I think, uh, you know, when I was a kid, the Mustang was not considered collectible because they built a million of them the first year. Why would you collect something like that? Well, now it's one of the most collectible cars ever for precisely that reason. I think the first generation Miata will be seen as a uh, collectible car, twin cam, a five-speed. Oh my God, it's a real sports car. Uh, I think first-generation Priuses will be interesting because they're just cute. They're like, oh, look how simple this hybrid system is, you know? And it's also the thing, again, going back to why, what attracts you to vehicles. Right. You're attracted to vehicles that tell a story about their manufacturer, about the age in which they were built, the things that make something important as an object will drive collectability in the future, and, and they are building cars that have moved the automotive needle along. And those yeah, will be and the it's cars also that, uh, cars you had experiences in. I mean, I was very fortunate. Or with? Uh, yeah, Johnny Carson left in. me. John, no, in. Oh yeah, oh, oh with, those with, cars with, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johnny Carson left me his dad's '39 Chrysler, and I got pictures of Johnny, 12 years old, polishing that car. F footage of Johnny polishing and washing the car, you know? So it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of whatever affects you. I think the Taurus show will be collectible in 50 years, that first generation Taurus show, you know? I have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, Jay. First, thanks for all the years of entertainment. Oh, thanks. And I'm here with my 18-year-old that started his car collection two years ago. Okay. So, um, wanted to know, may I ask if you chose to drive up to Pebble Beach, and if you did, which vehicle did you choose to drive? No, no, I, I, I flew up. Uh, I flew up, and, uh, and uh, all moms hate motorcycles. You'll find that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I didn't drive anything. I'm one because it's, it's just a little crazy, and I, I'm in Phoenix tonight, and then I got to come back here for tomorrow. So uh, that's why I did that. Yeah, I got to show. Anything one more, else? one more Any, short yes. question. Oh, sorry, over here. Yeah, we haven't done this side of the room. How about just a request? You sing us a song before we go. The what? <laughs> sing us a song, song before we go. The last question. <laughs> 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 Excuse, no, no, they shouldn't say that because if you recall... Well, you're singing the, today. You're, you're doing the national anthem, right? Uh, no, actually, I, 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 the reason why I'm sort of rushing through this is that oh, that's right, I actually yeah. have to go out to Laguna Seca. They're having a um, little uh, event to honor the memory of Dan Gurney, and I'm going to sing Amazing Grace there, so oh, I've got awesome. to get out to the track. Well, can um, you give us a little preview of Amazing Grace? Yeah. It's a bit unorthodox, but uh, yeah. Take a sip of water first. Have a good glass of water first. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. I gotta say the rest there of the There we go, there we are, there, there we are. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, but, and by the way, in an episode last season, entitled The Car My Father Drove, Jay and I sang the Marseillaise together in a Peugeot 404. Oh, that's right. So yeah, there you go. Right. So yeah, Jay right. does actually sing on the cool. show. That's so. right. That's right. <laughs> well, cool. Well, thanks, everybody. So Thank cool. you very much for coming. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Thanks, Jane. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Thank Donald. You. Thank you.